welcome to Definitely Not Funny. Actually, the least funny person I know. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Definitely Not Funny. I am your host, Jackie Norris. And today we're back with another fun little episode. This one's like, I don't know, this one's like a little serious, but still a little fun. But I think it's interesting. Like when I was doing all the prep work for this episode, at first I was like, oh, this is going to be a lot of work. But then I started doing it and I was like, wait, this is like very, very topical and like very important. And so I feel like I need to, I need to step it up here. So this is going to be a lot of me reading off my computer, which is weird with the video because I'm not used to doing the video on a solo episode. So usually for solo episodes, I like write out everything that I'm going to say. And so now I'm going to have to like read it and say it to you, but look at you while I'm saying it. I don't know. It's where a teleprompter would be useful, but what the fuck am I going to do with the teleprompter? One day, one day I'll have a teleprompter and I'll be able to read these episodes directly to you. But for now, I'm going to read them from my computer. We'll still have video footage. It's okay. So today we're talking about quarter life crises, crises, crisis, my quarter life crisis, everyone's quarter life crisis, the idea of a quarter life crisis. It's a real thing. That's what I found out. This is what my investigative journalism has told me, is that a quarter life crisis is a real thing. It's funny. I'm like kind of nervous to talk about this topic. Maybe that's because I'm in the middle of a quarter life crisis. So it feels very personal and very topical. But I think that makes it the most important time for me to talk about it. So it's a real thing. If you search we're going to kind of, we're going to go into the quarter life crisis. We're going to break it down. We're going to really talk about it, all the different aspects of it, what's going on, my perspective on it. And I don't really have any like positive action items of like what to do. <laughs> this is more, this is not the like, here's what we're going to do about it. This is more of like, look, this is what it is. And it's a thing and it's happening and it's normal. And it's like, okay, that it's happening. It's a normal thing. That's kind of what I really want to focus on here. Um, and sort of say like it's a universal experience that a lot of us have and it's not a bad thing because you're figuring so much stuff out so when you google quarter life crisis the first thing that comes up is the wikipedia page so I was like okay I'll go to the wikipedia page what that says is in popular psychology a quarter life crisis is a crisis involving anxiety over the direction and quality of one's life which is most commonly experienced in a period ranging from a person's early 20s to their mid 30s. Does that ring a bell for anyone? <laughs> Does that sound like you? <laughs> okay. So the quarter life crisis occurs in one's 20s, usually after entering the real world. So that could be like just graduating from college, moving out of your childhood home. Shout out me in my childhood home right now. It's I'm going to talk about it when I'm going to talk about it right now. I'm calling it the QLC instead of the quarter life crisis. Okay, we abbreviated it. Um, I'm going to talk about it in terms of leaving college and going into the real world just because that's the experience I had. And I also want to talk about it in regards to COVID and what I believe the impact of COVID has had on everyone's quarter life crisis. You know what I mean? Um, also on Wikipedia, it says it is defined by clinical psycho psychologist Alex Falk. Folk, I don't know how to pronounce his name, F-O-W-K-E. If you know how to pronounce that, shoot me a text. Um, as a period of insecurity, doubt, and disappointment surrounding career, relationships, and financial situation. So I am actually going to also add identity to this list. I do think like identity is wrapped up in all of these aspects, but I think identity is its own idea during the QLC that <laughs> is worth noting. Oh, and then it says on Wikipedia, Common symptoms of a quarter-life crisis are often feelings of being lost, scared, lonely, or confused about what steps to take in early adulthood. They're not wrong. So when we look at all that, the four aspects that we're talking about here are career, relationships, finances, and identity. So I am now going to go in and break down those four different aspects career. We're starting there. You're no longer a student. You're a working professional. 
And so your career kind of becomes your main identity because when you're in college, your career is like, I mean, not your career. When you're in college, you're, when you like introduce yourself to people, you're like, I'm a student. I study here. I majoring in this, but like I'm a student and that's what I do. And that's your identity. So when, because that is what you spend most of your time doing. So when you leave college and you go into like the real world, your identity is wrapped up in your career, which is what you spend most of your time doing. So you would kind of introduce yourself as like, I'm a physicist, I'm a doctor, I'm a writer, I'm a et cetera. And that kind of becomes a big part of your identity. So that's why I think career is so important and why it was put at the beginning of this list. I do think as a result of COVID, career has become less of a main part of our identities for those of us currently in our 20s and who were really greatly impacted by COVID during the transition from college to real world. I think that really has to do with just remote work and the fact that we're not in office and Some people are in office and I think they have a different relationship to career and a different experience with their career than people who are remote. I happen to be hybrid, so I'm in two days a week and it's just a completely, it's a completely different experience. And so I think because you're not, for most of us, we're not spending nine to five, five days a week in an office with a group of people. That's not our biggest part of our identity. If we're going in only like two days a week, that's not the, the thing you're doing most with your time. The thing that you're doing most with your time is probably sitting in your apartment or in your childhood bedroom <laughs> at myself. <laughs> um, this, I think, is both a positive and a negative thing. I think there's definitely positives and I think there's negatives. I think on the positive side, we are less defined by our careers Um, so we're less siloed in personal relationships, if that makes sense. I mean, I granted, I don't know what it was like prior to COVID. So I don't know how people like interacted with each other based on their careers or whatever, but I do think, I do assume that it's likely people with similar careers had similar lifestyles. So they would spend more time with each other. Whereas now, because our career is not such a big part of our identity and it doesn't define our lifestyle as much in terms of the day to day, uh, because we're all just working from home, your relationships are less siloed. So you're friends with people in other industries doing other things. You also have more time to engage in hobbies, like connect with roommates, spend time with people outside, travel, like do all these different things. There's a lot of things that you're able to do because of remote work um that weren't the case before and I think that's definitely a positive thing I think on the negative side you are missing out on the connection with others within your same like industry career company etc I know like my manager has she's told me she's like yeah I met my husband at work at her old job her and her husband worked her and this man worked together and then they like started dating and got married And I couldn't fathom that happening because I don't spend enough time with the people in the office. How could I like get to know someone enough to like date them? You know what I mean? I do think I have an exception for that because I have my friend Sean. I love Sean. She's not listening, but one day she'll listen and then she'll be like, oh my God, she gave me a shout out. So cute. So maybe, but (laughs) because we did go on our trip together and that was like amazing But other than that, like, I'm not, like, super close with the people I work with, especially, I mean, I've I've been switching offices all over the place. I'm all over the country, bing, 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 ping, pong, bin ball, but that's different. I think a lot of people, because you're not so wrapped up in the identity of your career, another negative is that you feel, like, a lack of purpose or engagement from career and so you feel lost trying to find that in other places it can feel really really aimless because you're kind of like okay well I'm not like getting my social connection and my community and my purpose and everything like from my career so I'm like where am I going to get that from and then that's why people like I don't know do all these random things and you're like trying to find it from like run club or something but run club isn't going to do that for you you know what it, maybe it will but like for most people it won't and so then you're like it because it's not the same of intensity as having like a full-time five day a week job I mean whatever five day in-person job you know what I mean so with career I think it's kind of 
definitely strongly impacted by COVID, especially now and how our generation and our cohort is viewing career and experiencing career. But I don't know what I was going to say. That's it. That's the, <laughs> that's the end of the thought. No more. Okay, next. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Done with career. To relationships. So I could do a full episode on relationships in your 20s during your QLC. Um, and maybe I will. I might do that. But here I'm just going to like briefly touch upon it because we got so much to talk about. And... I don't want to get like too, too deep into it. I think with the relationships, I kind of broke it up into four categories. There's family, friendships, romantic, and then community. A community I added in relationships because I think it is very different than the other three categories. I don't think community is the same as friendships. And that's something I didn't realize until after I graduated college because when you're in college, Your friends are your community because you do everything together and you live together and you eat all your meals together and you go to classes together. And so, and everyone knows each other. All your friends know, like, my friend here knows this friend here knows this friend here. Like, you're all one big community. Whereas, like, post-grad, it's like, I have some friends here who don't know my friends over here and neither of them know my friends over there. And so, I have these, like, separate friends groups, which are great but they're not a community. Does that make sense? So going back to family. Family, I think it's very different in your 20s. You're not automatically close with your family. You're not living with them. You're not dependent on them. And if you have siblings, your siblings are growing up and everyone's living their own lives. So with family, it really is a factor of like how much you put in is how much you get out. And do you stay connected with your family are you constantly trying to reach out to them are you talking to them do you guys do things together or if you're like you know what I don't like my family I don't want to be a part of it like you can separate yourself from your family and that's a weird that's very different that's something we haven't experienced yet before and it's kind of getting to the point of like when you get into romantic relationships like are you building your own family etc and how you're gonna go about that but thinking more about like immediate family in the present it's it's different. It's regarded very differently. And you are now like an independent person. So it really is a factor of how much you put in is how much you're going to get out of your family connection. With friendships, I think you lose your convenience friends from college. You, unless you like all live in the same city, I think a lot of the times you'll lose them immediately. Like if you have like some convenience friends where like, you guys really were just friends out of convenience because you like liked the same things and you lived in the same place and you kind of had like the same friend group um if they move to one part of the country and you move to another part of the country like you're not going to stay in touch and I think accepting that is okay like realizing that that's that's not a reflection on you that's not a reflection on them it's not a bad thing there's no ill will there it's just like you were friends because of convenience and now you've grown apart and you're doing separate things and it doesn't make sense for you to maintain that relationship and that can be really sad like I have a couple friends like that where like I feel like I've like lost some friends and it's really sad because I miss them and like I fucking loved these girls at one point and they were my best friends and I was like I would do anything with them and now I'm like I don't know when the next time I'll see them I don't know the last time I talked to them and like that's really sad but there's only like so much you can really reach out you know what I mean but also like part of this is on me like I haven't been the best at reaching out to people because I've got so much other shit going on that I'm like what am I got like it's hard to keep it top of mind so convenience friends you can lose them I think friendships are also super hard to maintain because your lifestyle completely changes like you're living in other parts whatever so but what I think can be really special about this though is that you're close you're so your loose friends you kind of will lose them a bit but your close friends you become really close with like one of my best friends from school I'm like we met first week freshman year literally Kristen you guys know her um and I think we're closer than we've ever been even though we literally live on other sides of the country like we don't have any friends in common um but we 
stay connected and we talk all the time and we're really close because we put in that effort and so that relationship is just that much stronger because of that and that I think is something that's really special that happens with friendships post-college I think you're also because with all these other factors during your QLC you're changing and evolving so who you want to be friends with and what your common interests are evolves too so it's natural that your friendships would be evolving and changing. It's hard though because it's much easier to lose friends than it is to make friends. And that's why I think the friends you have or you make or you nurture those friendships with become so special because you like, it's not like an everyday thing, if that makes sense. It's like, these are my really special friends and they become these really special, wonderful connections. I think... There's not that many built-in organic ways to make friends. I think with work and being in office five days a week, that was definitely a built-in organic way to make friends. But now that's not the case. There's not like, you have to really seek it out. You got to really like go out and like find ways to make friends. And so I've had friends that like join pickleball leagues or do like pottery or like things like that. And so that's like an interesting way to make. But at the same time, it's not like college like it's not like they live down your hall you're in a class with them three days a week for two hours at a time you all go to lunch at the same place you have the same time of days free on weekends you're all going to the same parties like that's not the case if you like join a pickleball club you're like pickleball league you're like playing pickleball with them once an hour like once a week for an hour and then you go about your separate ways so it's it's not that it's impossible it's just a lot harder it's a lot harder and I think if you were in the office five days a week it would be like you're here five days a week you're sitting next to this person you're getting lunch together you're talking about fucking everything like you become close so hopefully you like them but I think now with this shift in not going into the office five days a week and working remotely I've noticed people in my like people that I'm friends with, people that I'm connected with on social media, like how they're finding community. And I am seeing all these little like communal groups sort of pop up. So like Run Club is like such a great community. And I think that's such a positive thing. That was something I did in LA that I loved. I'd see the same people every week. We'd run together. It was great. Like it was a fun place to meet up. Um, And there's other little activities like that that I think are starting to really blossom and people are really starting to build communities from. So I'm excited to see what the transition is to where people are going to get their strong community from in their 20s because it's not coming from the office, if that makes sense. Okay, next one, romantic relationships. I've done multiple episodes on this. So I'm not going to like, I'm not going to harp on this and say everything that I've already said. Um. We love talking about relationships. They're very interesting, especially romantic relationships. I think during your QLC, (laughs) I'm loving the term, there is so much pressure on romantic relationships. It kind of feels like everyone who's anyone is in one. And it is such a defining factor of their life and their and decisions at this point in time. Like people who are in a relationship, like they live with their partner. And like they decide what city they're going to live in because of their partner and who they're dating. Like they make big decisions together. That's like not the case in college. In college, you're like, ah, I'm dating this guy in this frat because he's like kind of cute and I like to hook up with him. Okay. Like, and then whatever. Obviously, you develop a connection. Um, I don't know. But you're not like making big decisions based off this person and I think relationships in the real world versus college like in college one it was way more fun to be single it was like more fun to be single than it was to be in a relationship and it's more fun to be single in college than it is to be in the real world and there was no pressure or expectations on it like you were just dating someone because you liked them there was no like am I dating this person because like I want to spend the rest of my life with them or because I want to it's like no like right now like I kind of want to go to invite with this person And, like, I'd be mad if they hooked up with someone else. So, like, I'll make them my boyfriend. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It's kind of how I thought about it. 
<laughs> but it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. But now it feels like it really matters because it's like, ooh, very serious. Okay. Lastly, community. I've touched upon community, I think, in all of these different aspects. But I could really just do a full episode on just community and the importance of it. Maybe I will. But from my experience and seeing the experiences of my friends, I think a lot of people feel a serious lack of community. And I actually think one way that people are finding community is through social media and just media in general. Like I actually feel with like the influencers I follow, I feel a sense of community with the people who also follow them and I feel connected to them, if that makes sense. Like that's a very new and interesting way to find community. And so this is going to sound so fucking hokey, but like that's kind of what I hope to build with my show is I want to build this sense of community of people who are like-minded, um, but also different and <laughs> people are like this, but also like this, but also like this, blah, 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 blah. but people have similar interests and just kind of want to like hang out and like a similar vibe. I don't know. I think that's really, really special. Okay. Next section finances. So this is super like, I think the finance aspect is fascinating. I think in college and all of everything I'm about to say is a, is a major generalization. So take it with a grain of salt, take it or leave it. You don't have to listen if you don't want to. But I think in general and in my experience in college, you and your friends were on a similar playing field, if that makes sense. Like you could do all the same things regardless of your major, etc. Like you all lived in the same dorm. You all like in the same building. Everyone paid the same amount for housing because they all lived in a dorm. Um, and whether you were on financial aid or not, like you lived in your dorm and everyone sort of lived there. And it wasn't like some people had bigger rooms, some people had smaller rooms, but that was just random. That wasn't dependent on finances or anything. Um, you had the dining halls. Everyone ate at the dining halls. Like that's where you would eat. You would eat at the dining hall. You would eat at, you're like, you're, I ate at my sorority. Obviously there's different aspects to this. Like I want to make it like very clear that I understand that like even like being in a sorority was like a financial commitment that a lot of people don't get to have. Um, but I'm talking about like within the sorority or like within the university and like within the dorm, if that makes sense, kind of overall, it was less, it's less of a difference than it is post-college. So I'm going to get to the post-college part but I think in college, the financial situation is less of a differentiator than in my experience, I've seen it post-college. And you could do like, it didn't matter what your major was. Like if your major could have been whatever, you could only eat in the same dining hall. Um, and you all live in the same dorm and like sort of do the same things and can all like go to the same party. Like it doesn't matter because like I'm a business major and someone else is an engineering major like we can do whatever whatever we felt like that's not the case in the real world so like my friend who's an elementary school teacher cannot do the same things as my friend who works in investment banking so you can't like you don't get to just like live where you want because that's where your friends are living it's like you live where you can afford and if your friends make more money, they can afford something nicer. So they're going to live somewhere nicer. And so that differentiates you. Um, your friends who make more money can go on like some crazy vacation. And you might not be able to go on the vacation because you're making less money than them because you have different interests and you chose a different career path. And so... It's where like the decisions you make based off of like your interests and your career and like how much work you want to put in and what you want to do start to really impact actually the experiences you can have. Um, but granted, but then there's there's another aspect of that where it's like my friend who works for an investment banking can't come to dinner on Wednesday night because she's working until 11 p.m. So you're sort of like it's a, a very much like a give and take. I hope this is making sense. I, finances, I think, is a very t touchy topic to talk about. And so I never want to, like, make assumptions or insert myself anywhere. But 
I do think it's really worth acknowledging during your 20s because I think it does make a huge difference. And they inherently become divisive. Finances inherently become divisive and determine really where you can live and what you can do. I also think people view finances and spending very differently and that becomes even more apparent as you emerge into the real world. You have different relationships with money and how to treat it and how to use it. I know like the way I spend money and regard money is so different than the way my brother Tyler regards money. Night and day, literally night and day. And so that also impacts the experiences we have and the things we do. I think during your quarter life crisis, you're trying to navigate and figure out your relationship with money while also being controlled by it in some way. And you don't have a lot of it. Like most people when you graduate don't have a lot of money. Maybe you have student loans. Like you owe you owe money. You don't have money. You don't have like savings. You just, you like have very little money and you're trying to like live and keep up and do all these things while being conscious and stressed about money for the first time in your life. I think... For a lot of people also, this can be the first time that they have to seriously budget and like also plan for a financial future. So like be thinking about like, okay, like health insurance and like how is that going to come out of my paycheck, my paycheck and how am I going to put money into a 401k to like plan for my financial future and does that make sense while I'm also needing enough money to spend right now in the present day for the life I want to live and like making these trade-offs and figuring out how to do that I think is also very challenging we're not really taught that there's no like I don't know maybe there are courses now but when I was in school there was no like real course on how to do like personal finances which is fascinating because I took finance courses but I never took like a personal finance course so food for thought um lastly identity there are so many questions here around identity it's very much like who am I? What do I value? What are my goals? What am I doing? Et cetera. I think all of these aspects that we've mentioned are tied up on your identi- in your identity. And when they're in flux, your identity is also in flux. So in college, like I was a business student who belonged to a sorority and like a woman's volunteer group. And so when people ask me like, what do you like, tell me about yourself or whatever, like, what's your deal? Nice to meet you. Like I had these things that I was grounded in and these communities I belonged to that I felt really passionate about and felt were like key identifiers for me. But in the real world, it's sort of like I have my job, which again, I feel connected to because I like it, but I don't feel like it's not my like end all be all because I'm not doing it all the time. I ain't like I'm not in person doing it all the time. And then I think doing this podcast has really helped me shape my sense of identity, which has been a huge, huge positive. But every day I think I'm still trying to find my identity and I think we all are. I think a large part of identity is tied to where you live and that might be one of the reasons why it's been so challenging for me to decide where to move to because it feels like I'm deciding my identity and it's and like all of these other factors, career, relationships, finances, identity, everything feels really dependent on where I'm living. So it is like such a big overwhelming decision indicative of the quarter life crisis. So in conclusion, the quarter life crisis or the QLC is very real. It's very scary. There are a lot of moving parts, but It's incredibly normal and no shit you feel this way. Of course you feel this way. It's normal. This makes sense. I'm hoping that some part of this episode resonated with you or you felt like connected. And that's like another thing I want from this podcast is like to feel that sense of connection and feel that sense of community and like, holy shit, I feel that way or like I get that or like that makes sense to me and oh my gosh, that's articulated in a way that I didn't think of before. But now that explains why I'm feeling that way. Like those are the things that are really important to me with this show and why I'm kind of holding on to it while I swing through my quarter life crisis (laughs) and try to get through it. So 
I wish I had some like magical takeaways that are like if you do these five things it's gonna get better I think it's really just like you hold on for the ride and like you hold on for the ride you enjoy the ride try your best to enjoy the ride figure it out but you know that like the roller coaster like will figure itself out and you'll go back to smooth sailing just like know that that it's going to happen and then I think because it happens for everyone it seems like like they everyone sort of figures their shit out eventually I think so. Unless you have Peter Pan syndrome. And that's a whole nother, whole nother episode is the men in, on, in LA with Peter Pan syndrome. But I think just knowing like it's going to be okay. You're going to be good. And you're not alone. And this is super normal. It makes sense. Given all of these factors, it makes sense why you'd feel a little confused and a little unsettled. Okay, I love you guys. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Um, follow at Def Not Funny Pod on Instagram and now on TikTok. Ooh, I'm posting all the little clips to TikTok now to a separate account because I just, I don't know. I had a moment. Just give it to me. And yeah, um, you can watch this video on YouTube or Spotify. And you can listen wherever you get podcasts. So share it with a friend. If you have a friend who you've been like talking to about like, oh my God, life is so crazy. What's going on? Blah. Send them this podcast and talk about it with them and see what they think. Okay. That's enough of me promoting myself. I love you guys. You rock. Thanks for hanging out with me. Okay. I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Did you laugh? I didn't.